My name is Marianne Bates, um, and I'm the Deputy Director of JPL's North America office. Um, I'm extremely excited to be here today. I think we have a phenomenal group of partners from government, um, an exceptional group of researchers here, and we'll spend the next day, uh, day and a half, um, with each other in, in what, what I'm very excited about and how we can learn from each other and be inspired by what has the collaborations that have already happened and the ones that are just emerging. So I'm very excited to have you all here today. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a story that takes us far away from the US to begin with um, to give an example of a case where government and researchers partnered and then also acted on the evidence um, in a really productive way and on a relatively short timeline. So I want to start with that story as kind of an inspirational example to get started, and then I'll touch on uh, JPL's approach and why we launched the State and Local Innovation Initiative and why we're here today. So I'll begin with that. Um, so we're, we're going all the way to Indonesia, and the example that I want to talk about is a program run by the government of Indonesia called Raskin, and it was a rice subsidy program targeted at the poorest 25% of households in Indonesia, and it was a major, major program. So we're talking about approximately $2.15 billion per year. And in a 2012, the government of Indonesia, under the office of the vice president, was interested in exploring tweaks to the program. Because the program, as it was running at the time, uh, had a number of leakages. So the eligible households were only receiving about one-third of the amount of rice that was intended, and they were paying about 25% higher cost than they should have. So the graphic that you see, the idea, the, the program was designed such that eligible households should get rice at a subsidy at 20% of the market cost. But the actual price that was being paid was about 25% higher than that. And so the government was exploring a number of reforms, and one of the ideas that they had was an ID program. So the reason, the hypothesized reason for why uh, the rice was not reaching the intended beneficiaries is both a question of who was getting the rice and at what price. So some of those who were eligible for the subsidy program weren't getting the rice, and some people who weren't eligible for the program were. And then, as I mentioned, there was also the price component. So they had this idea to um, use ID cards to solve part of that problem and also potentially print the price on the ID cards so that there's better information for the people who should get the subsidy and others on what price they really should be paying. Um, but they were worried. They thought this could work. But they were worried that perhaps there would be some unintended consequences as well. Maybe the program wouldn't work as well as they thought it would. Perhaps there might even be some negative consequences. You could imagine if an ID program like this is introduced, perhaps there could be conflict in the communities. If there was a historical difference in who was getting the rice compared to what the eligibility criteria were. And so the, the vice president wanted evidence, rigorous evidence on the impact of the program. And they partnered with JPAL affiliates. We have an office in Southeast Asia and worked with them to build a randomized evaluation into the rollout of the ID card program. And they tried a couple of different things. So they worked with the researchers together to figure out how to design an evaluation that was useful for the government and also interesting from an academic perspective in advancing the state of knowledge on, on how we can effectively uh, run government programs like this. And so they collaborated together to design an evaluation that tested different components. What's the impact of providing the ID cards? What's the impact of adding the price of the rice on the ID cards for some of those? What's the impact of also doing other engagements with the community that might be complementary to the ID card program to try to prevent any um, reductions in social cohesion, so to speak? So this, they, they ran the evaluation. Um, here's an, an example of the ID cards that were done. And they found that there was a significant improvement in the amount of the subsidy received by the eligible households. And because this evaluation was done in tandem with the government, both the initial results and then the longer term results were presented on a short turnaround. And the overall timeline from the time the baseline survey was conducted at the start of the evaluation until government action was only 18 months. And the government learned from the evaluation and decided to scale up the ID card program. 
And within 18 months, most of the scale-up had already occurred, and scaling up to 15 and a half million um, ID cards, which means it's reaching about 65 million people. So this was a, this is not only a major program, but the change in policy affected um, a significant number of, of people in Indonesia. So how did this happen? What's the backstory? I, I glossed over a lot of things to make this sound relatively easy, right? Um, and one really important component of this, there's, there's a much longer, more detailed story, but I think the key lesson for us today is that this evaluation didn't happen in a vacuum, and it wasn't the first collaboration that JPAL affiliates had done with the government of Indonesia. So our co-scientific directors for Southeast Asia office, Rima Hanna and Benjamin Olkin, had spent years building a relationship with the government of Indonesia, had done prior evaluations with them, and had built a mutual um, relationship of trust with them. And the other thing that I think was really crucial here is that it wasn't that the idea for the ID card program was developed in isolation only by the government, and it wasn't that the evaluation was designed only by academic researchers, it was a collaboration between the two and that they worked together to figure out what's the question we want to answer, what's the problem we're trying to solve, and how could we feasibly build an evaluation into the rollout of this new program in a way that teaches us quite a lot, and teaches us something that's not just useful for Indonesia, but that's also been informative for many governments around the world. So that's, that's my inspirational uh, story to begin with. And now I'd like to talk a little bit more about how those kinds of evaluations have informed why we've brought all of you here together and why we launched the uh, innovation initiative that we did. So let me just take a step back um, and give an overview a little, uh, a little bit on JPAL's approach overall. So JPAL's mission is to ensure that policy is driven by evidence and research is translated into action. JPAL stands for the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. And the three main activities that we conduct connect in the, in the way that you see here. So one is the evaluations. Our affiliated professors and our staff work together on, on running randomized evaluations, sometimes in collaboration with government, sometimes in collaboration with nonprofit organizations or other firms. And then we have these complementary activities that go around that as well. So one is policy outreach. And the policy outreach bookends the evaluations in two ways. So one is that on the back end, once evaluations have been completed, we do a lot of work to try to ensure that the results are shared with the world, not only in academic journal articles, but also through policy briefs, um, through syntheses of evidence, and I think perhaps most importantly, by actually talking with people and building relationships and helping them understand what evidence might be relevant in their context. So that's after studies are completed. On the other side, before studies begin, we also do a lot of relationship building and listening, where we go to different government partners, we go to practitioners, and we try to understand what are the priorities that they have, what are the questions that they're most interested in answering, and how can we have that inform the research agendas um, of our network of researchers and, and the work that we do as an organization. And then we also do capacity building. And I put this in a couple of categories. So we run executive education courses, we run custom trainings for organizations or people who are interested in learning. You know, I want to run a randomized evaluation. How do I do that in practice? And a lot of, so we do those formal training um, activities, but I think a lot of what we do as well is in sharing what's worked for us and what hasn't. So we've done many evaluations around the world, We've made mistakes, right? Some evaluations have gone well, some evaluations have had trouble. These things you know, come and go. How can we make sure that we share both the strategies that we've learned work well for building evaluation into programs and share the mistakes that we've made so that others don't repeat them, right? So a lot of knowledge sharing across different researchers and across practitioners and policymakers who've engaged in this work. So overall, um, we have over 790 ongoing and completed randomized evaluations that our network of affiliated professors has done around the world. We have over 140 professors at universities both across the US and around the world. Many of them are economists. And what brings them together is that all of them, as at least part of their research portfolio, conduct randomized evaluations of, of policies. And these go across many different sectors. So it, it's, too, it's hard for you to read, but the different colored dots on this map represent evaluations in the area of education, or health, or crime, or environment and energy, labor markets, a wide, wide range of subjects. Um, and we, as I mentioned before, we have regional offices around the world. I should mention 
J-PAL North America is actually the new kid on the block. So J-PAL has been around for about 14 years now. The North America office launched just over three years ago um, with generous support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And we've been able to learn um, quite a lot from the approaches that have been tried around the world and also from the long history of randomized evaluations and research that have been going on in the US for, for a long time. I also want to mention at this point um, Jonathan Gurian and Melissa Carney who are here. They're the co-chairs uh, with me of the initiative, the State and Local Innovation Initiative, and provide a lot of the uh, scientific oversight and guidance for this initiative as well. Um, I also want to mention Julia Chabrier. Where's Julia? There she is. She's the initiative manager for the State and Local Innovation Initiative. I'm, I'm sure many of you have gotten many emails from her, and now uh, hopefully you know, you'll also get to meet her in person, and, and we'll meet more of the staff later on as well. So one thing that I want to highlight, when we, when we decided to launch the State and Local Innovation Initiative, we thought about the projects like the Raskin evaluation that I just mentioned in Indonesia, and some of the other evaluations that we had done in the US and around the world. And one of the things that struck us was that many of the most helpful evaluations, the ones where we learned the most, the ones where policies were changed as a result of the evaluation, happened in the context of a strong relationship between an institutional partner, a government, and researchers. And so we'll be hearing some examples today of, of studies that have been done in the past. And we looked at those and we said, you know, these, are, these cases where research projects are developed jointly can be phenomenally valuable and useful, but they're also too rare. And they don't happen often enough. And we thought a lot about, you know, why is it that they're so rare? So we're starting, you know, with the hypothesis that you have, you know, innovative government leaders and you have university-based research teams, and bringing the two together can be really helpful. Um, there are complementarities in, to the two, but that it doesn't happen automatically. So there are a lot of government partners who are innovating with different policies and approaches, are constantly trying new things, and might have an appetite for doing rigorous evaluation of their programs and learning lessons that can be shared widely, um, but they might not have on their staff capacity or bandwidth to conduct these kinds of evaluations in-house, and it's also hard for them to know which researchers might share my research interests and also have bandwidth. They might know of a few researchers locally or otherwise that they can call up, but it's hard for them to know beyond the researches they already do, which ones might be able to help them. On the other hand, we have a whole set of um, academics who sit within universities who are really excited about partnering with governments on research but it's hard for them to know which government partners are open to engaging with external academics on these kinds of experiments and research projects, and which ones are interested in areas that overlap with their research interests. And then even when those two come together, it can be hard to find funding for the evaluations that might want to be conducted on a turnaround that's quick enough to take advantage of open windows of opportunity that present themselves in policy. So that's kind of the problem that we wanted to solve in, in or at least start to address with the State and Local Innovation Initiative. So the three things that we're bringing together, um, we summarize as matchmaking, technical assistance, and project funding. So on the matchmaking side, part of what we do is help build connections between governments who send us letters of interest and say, here are the questions that we're really interested in, and academics who share those research interests too. Um, and then technical assistance. So we have staff who have experience on multiple randomized evaluations who can have some of those initial conversations. You know, what does my sample size need to be? What kinds of data do I need to line up now or later? How could we feasibly build in random assignment into this program? Can we do it this way or that way? Should it be phased in or not, right? So that kind of uh, the ongoing conversation that needs to happen at the very early stages when we're exploring potential partnerships that could be made. And then the third is project funding. So we've... Um, we have some generous funding, as I mentioned, from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation for this initiative and are able to provide pilot grants and then slightly larger evaluation grants to ensure that when evaluations are ready to get going, we have resources available to, to cover those costs. So that's an overview um, of kind of why we're here. I'd like to shift gears a little bit now and talk about uh, what we're doing today and tomorrow with the workshops that we have with some of the state and local representatives. So today we're going to highlight a number of government partnerships, um, ones from Chicago and South Carolina across different 
uh, areas of housing, of criminal justice, of maternal and child health. And we'll be hearing from a number of partnerships where you hear both the research side of the story and the government partner side of the story. And part of the reason that we intentionally made this a relatively small group is that we wanted to have the opportunity for you to engage in conversation. So for each of these panels, we'll be setting aside significant time for questions, and we hope that you'll really engage with us on that. Um, and then tomorrow, we'll have workshops with state and local government representatives and research partners that dive much more into the nuts and bolts of how to design these evaluations and work through some of the operational questions that many of our partners are, are working through right now. Um, I'll mention at this stage too, we're, we are live streaming today's event. So as we engage in this conversation and ask questions, we'll be passing around a mic so that the, those who are listening in online can also hear that. Um, we also have uh, a Twitter hashtag and you can follow us on Twitter and ask questions on Twitter if you would like to. I'll show the, the screen for that in a moment. So you can look in your agenda for what we will do next. Um, I'll start by introducing the moderator for our first panel, which is Quentin Palfrey. He's our executive director uh, for the JPAL North America office, and he was previously the senior advisor for jobs and competitiveness in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, where, and while he was there, he served as the lead White House policy staffer on a successful patent reform effort that led to the signing of the American Invents Act. Um, prior to that, during the White House, he was the Deputy General Counsel for Strategic Initiatives at the U.S. Department of Commerce, and we're very fortunate to have him as our Executive Director. So please join me in welcoming Quentin, who will then introduce our first panel. <laughs> 